verse. So every time he'd say a verse, it, it threw us off because, well, there's, there's no quote. I'm glad I wasn't the only no, it took me a minute to figure out what was going on. So this afternoon, uh, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, this is uh, just uh, some thoughts that the Lord laid on my heart uh, while I was at that conference uh, on, on that last day. Uh, just a, nothing that was actually really preached, but it's amazing how when the Spirit of God works, sometimes he touches you in ways uh, that, uh, uh, that the, the preacher never intended. When I got saved, the, the preacher who was preaching that day uh, wasn't preaching a salvation message. But God impressed upon me my need of salvation. Uh, so it, 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 I appreciate the fact that the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, uh, is, uh, uh, has a way of working in our hearts. So, so this passage, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, is just going to be a jumping point. It's, it's not a typical message. Typically, I like to preach from one passage and kind of break down that passage. Uh, but I have a thought, and I believe it's carried out throughout Scripture. Uh, I believe it's something that we... Uh, that we are able to, to, to look at the scripture in the context that it's in and we can gain some truth from it. So it's, uh, it's something for us. And it isn't a difficult thought. This isn't something that we don't understand, but sometimes understanding what, something that the Bible tells us to do and then doing it are two different things. And sometimes it's easier to, I, okay, I, I understand this truth, but then I, I have a hard time putting it into practice and or or completely in a practice. So that's this is this is my this is where we're at this evening or this afternoon. So First Corinthians chapter ten, uh, First Corinthians chapter ten. We're going to read a couple of verses here. We're going to end there with with verse thirty one. It says in starting in verse. Uh, we'll start with verse uh, twenty seven. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, that ye be disposed to go with whatsoever is set before you eat asking no questions for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Verse 32 says this, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I pleased all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Let's go ahead and have a quick word of prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Father, for how you work. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us this evening as we, as we attempt to take your word and the principles of your word and apply them to our lives. I, I ask that your spirit would guide us, Lord, that you would lead us, and that all that we do um, would truly bring honor to your name. Lord, you're worthy of our glory, uh, worthy of all glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. In the book of Revelations, uh, during the, uh, if you study the book out, there's much to be learned from there, and we're not going to, we won't turn there for sake of for sake of time, I don't want to take up your whole afternoon, though it's good to study the word. So, but, but in the book of Revelations, it, during the, uh, when the, the vial judgments, when the, the vials are being opened up, it talks about the judgments that are brought about uh, upon the people. And I heard a message on this um, a, a while ago on that particular passage. But it says that they repented not. Those that were being judged, that had those vials, the vials were the different judgments that were being brought upon the unbelievers during the tribulation time. And it's, that's prophecy, it's future. It's, it's not happened. But it says that, that, that those people who had gone through those tribulations repented not to glorify God. What, it, what it's saying is there were people that, although the Bible says that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess, that there are going to be those that refuse to, to profess the glory of God. They re, they're going to refuse to glorify him. They're not going to want to exalt him. They're not going to want to praise him. They're not going to want to, to lift him up. Instead, they're going to reject him. They're going to fight against him. Uh, we, we know that all nations at one point in time are going to rise up against God, and, and God in, in his sovereignty and God in his power will will overcome them. It, we, he will rule, he will rule, he will reign. Uh, he is the king of kings, the lord of lords. I've read the back of the book. Uh, uh, it's good, right? Uh, uh, but 
there will be those that refuse to glorify God. But as we stop and think about it, the, the truth is, all that God has created is created for the glory of God. David said in the book of Psalms that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament uh, showeth his handiworks. We look around this world and we see a beautiful creation that God has made here on this earth. We look up into the heavens and, and man, uh, uh, there are times when I am just, uh, just my, I can't even speak because of the, the beauty that I see there. And the more and more that, they, that we find as they, they build new telescopes and look further into the galaxies, uh, it, it just it, it amazes me it, it, that, that there's so much beauty and so much, uh, so much that God has created. It, it, and the Bible says it all declares his glory. In the, in, the, in the Gospels, when Jesus is coming in, on the, uh, riding in on the donkey, and they're, 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 they're saying hallelujah, and they're praising him, they're, they're worshiping him, and they're, 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 throwing the, the, they're, they're waving the, 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 the palm fronds, and they're throwing their coats on the ground. And the, the, the Pharisees were there, and they looked and said, listen, you need to tell your disciples to be quiet. And he said, if, I tell, if, if they were silent, the rocks would cry out. I don't, uh, uh, the rocks, uh, the, the creation of this, listen, the rock doesn't have a mouth. A rock doesn't have any ability to speak, but in, in, its, in, its, in, in its very existence, it glorifies the creator. When you look at, at, at the painting of, of Picasso or Rem, Rembrandt, and depending on if you like art or don't like art, you look, at, uh, you look at the beauty of something that's made, you don't say, wow, that is amazing. You'll say, that creation is amazing. It's beautiful. And what does it do? It doesn't glorify itself. It glorifies the, the, the person who made it, Right? The earth does the same thing. I, 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 when I studied, as, as I was studying medicine, the more and more I studied uh, how the body works and the intricacies of, of, of cell structure and how, how disease, the body fights disease and all those things, uh, I was amazed. It just, there's no way that stuff just happened. Right? There was a creator. There was, there, was, there was somebody who put it all together. It, those things glorify. They point others to Christ. I, I heard a testimony of a man the other day. He was a scientist. He was an atheist. He grew up in an atheist household. And the, in the, his study into the sciences turned him to God. Because it, uh, the more he delved into it and, and studied it, uh, he realized there had to be something more than just by accident. Now, there are those that are out there that will deny that, and, then, and, and there will always be those that deny it. But what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is everything points and glorifies God because that's what it was created for. When God created mankind, he created us for the same purpose. Our purpose here on this earth is to glorify God. Uh, uh, yes, uh, he created us for fellowship, to walk with him in the garden, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, but in their sin uh, that, that broke that fellowship. But the, the purpose for mankind was always and has always been to glorify God. We read, we read in our, 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 our beginning text this, this, this afternoon, uh, verse 31, it says, Whatsoever we do, whether we eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. Verse 31 there. Now, the context of this is, is there, were, there were certain Jews that, that, that struggled with the idea of, of eating certain things and, and because of the, the law and the things that were offered to idols. And, and, and Paul was saying that, uh, that, he, that we need to be careful to not be a stumbling block to, to those that may, uh, to, talking to the Gentiles, they need to be careful not to be a stumbling block to those Jewish believers because it may be for them, that for them they may be considered a sin to eat this. And so when you're with them, don't eat that so you don't cause them to sin. And they say, whether you eat or you don't eat, whether you drink or you don't drink, whatever it is you, you do, do it for this purpose. Glorify God. And this is the thought that struck me at this, at this uh, uh, conference uh, on, on the third day. One of the thoughts that struck me is, is what I do, does it glorify God? Because that, ver that word, that, that verse is, whatsoever ye do. Now, in the context, it's, it's talking about whether we eat or we don't eat, right? Uh, uh, whether we do this or don't do this. He says, I, I, I've got liberty to do it, but I don't want to, uh, in the context. But I believe the principle applies to everything that we do in our life. Our life is to bring honor and glory to God. 
We have been created for a purpose. Ephesians chapter 2 says, uh, says uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, is the, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But then it, then it goes on to say that we are his workmanship, created unto good works, that we might glorify our Father which is in heaven. Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5 says that we, should, that we should be the light of the world, that we are the light of the world. That they, should, and that they should see our good works and do what? Glorify our Father which is in heaven. Everything about our life is to glorify God. Everything that we do, not just the things that we do when everybody can see. Not just the things that we do here at church, but when we go to our job, our life is to glorify God. When we're sitting at the table with our family, our life is to glorify God. God. When we're walking down the street or we're going to the store, the things that we do should be done for the glory of God. It caused me to think. It caused me to wonder, what does the Bible have to say about how we are to glorify God? Let's look up a, a couple verses here. Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, I've got to look up, pull the verse up again, because Romans chapter 3, 7, that's the verse I'm looking for. In verse 7 it says this, for the uh, we'll go back to verse 5. But if our unrighteousness commend the unrighteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous? Who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? Uh, the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie lie unto his glory. The truth of God. What are we talking about? What's it talking about? It's talking about the, the, the truth of the word of God. It's abounded through us. Uh, and, and more than, uh, the, than the, the lie, the, the, the lies of our life. It's the truth of God that abounds to, to God's glory. The word of God works in you and I, does it not? Jesus said, uh, prayed in John chapter 17, sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. Uh, he told uh, the disciples, uh, ye are cleansed by my word. As the word of God works in us and changes us and sanctifies us, what does that do? It glorifies God. Remember, we're his workmanship, according to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, uh, he's working in us. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, I am confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He is working on us and in us through his word. We, uh, Colossians chapter uh, 3, 16. Uh, we're to uh, let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. There's the work of God through the word of God in us. And, but that, what does that do? It uh, abounds to his glory. It changes us and makes us more and more like Christ. As we read, we study the word of God that, 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 that makes us more like Christ as we yield to it. When we read the word of God, are we reading it to look, to look at it from that perspective? Because you can read things in a, in a, uh, for an educational understanding of the word of God. You can read it to understand what it says. Some people, and I've, done the, I've been guilty of this, I have been guilty of reading it to, to, to preach a message or to teach a lesson or, as Brother Guy and I were talking about, to win an argument. I, 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 used to, I, I still do love to argue. I don't argue with people nearly as much as I used to. But I, I, used to, I, I wanted to be right, and I would make sure I'd have the answer so I could show them the truth, but not because I wanted them to know the truth or that I wanted the truth to affect either one of us. I just wanted to win. We can read it for all the wrong reasons, but, uh, but when we get into the Word of God, I want you to understand the truth of the Word of God is there not just to help us win arguments. In fact, it's not there for that at all. It's to help us change. And as we change and we become more and more like Christ, we're washed and renewed and regenerated and transformed by the word of God, 
As, as Ephesians, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, we become the praise of his glory. Our life, it changes us and it makes us more and more like Christ. Are you reading the word of God to, 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 to help you to glorify God? Why is it that we read? We should have a hunger to know him. And the more we know him, the more we'll be like him. But is that why we read it? Or do we read it because, check, I did my, my duty for the day. Check, uh, I, I, can, I, I used to, when I was in Bible, the Bible Institute where I got my, my uh, when I was in the, the, the Bible Institute and I got my, to get my uh, degree, whatever it is, my, my diploma, um, it became a, one of the questions that we had to answer every single class was, have you read your Bible every day this week? And I read it many times so I could answer yes, because I like to have good grades. It was, it was uh, you had, you had uh, two questions on that test. One was, have you read it? And the, the second question is, will you read it next week? And you can at least get a 50. Well, if I haven't read it this week, you know, I'll read it next week. But my goal, in fact, I graduated with a 99.96. That was my average grade for all three years. Uh, I had a high GPA. I really, I, I really worked hard at that. So many of the times, I checked that bar box yes because I wanted to check that box yes. But the truth is, I don't know how many times I read it, and it didn't do me any good because I read it for the wrong reasons and the wrong purpose. The reason that we are to be in the Word of God is so that our lives will be changed and that we can glorify God. So that we can know more about him and know more about his word. And if we're reading it for the wrong reasons, I'm not going to tell you that it's a waste of time to read the Bible for the wrong reasons. The Spirit of God can work despite that. But we'll do a whole lot better if we do it for the right reasons. If we do it to glorify God. Look over uh, at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Not only does, uh, does the truth of God's word abound unto his glory, but we're going to look, look at verses, uh, we'll start at verse 16. It says, Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace, for the end of promise might be sure uh, to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. This is talking about our faith and Abraham's faith. And how we're saved. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him, whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Who against, who against hope believed in hope, that he might be become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in the faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promises of, promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Here you have Abraham. He's, he's 100 years old plus. Uh, he's got a wife who's, whose womb is beyond bearing children. It is physically impossible for them to have children. Now, we know that Abraham, Abraham, Abraham had another son. Uh, uh, with Hagar, his wife's handmaid. We know that that was not the will of God, but God allowed that to happen because of the, the wrong choices that they made. And, and, and it, it, in the end, became a thorn in the flesh of the, of the, of the Israelites uh, later, later on uh, uh, and, and caused problems in, their, in, in he and Sarah's marriage. Uh, there were many problems with all of that. But, but I want you to understand there was, that God waited for a specific reason. He could have given Abraham a son any time he wanted. He, he, he made it so that it was impossible for it to happen in any other way than the work of God. Why? Because that glorified God. My wife and I were told by doctors uh, for, for two years that we couldn't have kids. They were wrong. But I wasn't 100 years old. And my wife hadn't already gone through menopause. If that had happened, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have any kids right now. Number one, I'd be dead because that's really, really, really old. Uh, but Abraham, it says, that he staggered not at the promise of God. God promised him that he would have a son. And that his faith 
in the promise of God, glorified God. Understand that our faith glorifies God. It pleases God. Uh, if you, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, uh, says that without faith it's impossible to please God, right? For we must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So uh, we must have faith, but faith is necessary for salvation. Uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, all right? Uh, but, but not only are we, uh, are we to have faith in our, uh, in, our, in our salvation, not only have faith that God will reward us, but the Bible says we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, we're, uh, we have faith not in, in one another, not in the church, but we have faith in the promises of God, in the promises of his word. And when we trust his word and God shows himself strong in, in, in answering and fulfilling the promises of his word, that brings honor and glory to his name. So if faith glorifies God, then what does fear do? If faith glorifies God, the, the opposite of, of faith is fear. If I, instead of me trusting God and glorifying him through my faith, my worry, my anxieties, and my fear, they do the exact opposite. They say that God's not big enough for my problems. And it, it, listen, we live in a day and age where, where, where anxiety and fear rule. Uh, we've seen how it rules uh, uh, the people all across the world in the last, uh, in the last couple of years with COVID and all, this, all this, this stuff. Listen, God's bigger than all of that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be careful and shouldn't, uh, shouldn't, if you're sick, don't stay home. What I'm saying is God is bigger than all that. God is in control. Have faith. Have faith. And our faith will glorify God. Uh, it's not just faith when things are good. We're talking faith when things are bad. Faith when things are impossible. I want you to c continue on down this road with, with, with Abraham. Is Listen, he, he had his son. God blessed. He had this son, and, and, and this was the son of promise, and he was excited. He was, he was happy, and, and there came a day when God said, you need to take that son up on that mountain, and you need to kill him. It was a test of his faith. Now, Hebrews 11 tells us what was in his heart. Well, the, 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 in there in, in Genesis, it's, Genesis, it doesn't tell us what he was going on in his mind. It just shows his obedience. Uh, he, in the morning, he got up early, and he packed up the, he packed up the stuff, and, they, and he got the two servants, and he got his son, and they got the wood, and they, they headed up, and they got, he got the knife. He got everything he needed to do that. And, and he gets up there, but Hebrews 11 tells us this, that, 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 that he did that knowing, believing that if he killed his son, because this was the son of promise. God would raise him from the dead. That's faith. And we look at, I look back at that and think, I don't know how he did that. I, 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 couldn't, I, I couldn't tie my son down and pull out a knife knowing that my plan was to, to plunge it into his chest. I couldn't do that. And I don't know how he was able to do that other than by the grace of God. And, and listen, God knew his heart all along. I don't believe it was for God, to, for God to see his faith, I believe it was for us to see his faith. God already knew his heart. But we look at Abraham and we see, we see his faith uh, in God. And listen, as we see uh, uh, his faith in God, that should strengthen our faith. Because we see how God worked. Listen, the same thing works for others as they see our faith. When they see George's faith, or they see, see my mom's faith, or, or anybody else's, uh, somebody who believes in the promises of God, and they see God, the, those things fulfilled and taken care of, guess what? That glorifies God. So not only does the word of God working in us glorify God, but our faith in the promises of God glorify God. So I guess the question for, for this verse is, or these verses are, uh, is this. How is your faith glorifying God? Do you really trust in the word of God? Do you, uh, uh, if you know the word and the promises, do, are, are, is your faith in those? Or are you allowing fear to control everything that you do? Faith is the opposite, or fear is the opposite of faith. God does not give us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Now, that doesn't mean we... You should go jump off of a building saying, God's going to take care of me. Don't, ju don't run out in front of the, a truck and say, God will protect me because I'm not going to die until he wants me to die. Doesn't mean you're not going to be in a coma for 50 years. Don't, don't tempt God, but have faith. 
that God will fulfill his promises, and that will bring honor and glory to his name. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. We're going to read verses 6 and 7. Oh, let's go back to verse 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whereby receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Unity brings glory to God. Unity brings glory to God. He says that with one mind and one mouth glorify God. Now listen, that does not mean we are the same people. We are different. We all had different backgrounds, different stories. Uh, I got to hear uh, a couple of testimonies today of how they got, uh, people got saved. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, just, uh, it, it, every time I hear so, how somebody got saved, I, I just, I'm just so excited. Uh, what, what a blessing it is. Uh, but those stories are different from my story, and your story is different from those stories, because we all have our, our own past, our own background. But the, the, it's the same God who works in us. It's the same God that saves us. And listen, uh, all throughout Scripture, we're told that we are to be one, united in Christ. The same mind, with the same purpose, with the same God. There's one Lord, there's one Savior, there's one Spirit. Listen, uh, uh, I am thankful that we are one in Christ. That we're not separate. It doesn't mean that there aren't things that are, are different about us, but the Spirit of God unites us. But if unity glorifies God, do you know what that tells me? Division does not. Right? Unity and division are the exact opposites. Uh, just like fear and faith are opposites, unity and division are opposites. And we need to be very careful about how we treat other believers. Now, now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We, uh, we are, are Baptists because of the, the Baptistic doctrines. Uh, we believe the Word of God. We want to follow the Word of God. And there are, there are those that, that, that have differing, differing uh, beliefs or interpretations of what Scripture has to say about certain topics. And listen, I'm not saying that, uh, that everybody out there that says that they're a Christian is a Christian because it's not true. If, they're, if they believe in salvation and anything other than Jesus Christ, faith in Christ alone and the finished work on the cross, then they're not Christians. But just because somebody doesn't dress like us or talk like us or act like us doesn't mean they're not Christians. Now, that doesn't mean we need to link ourselves with every church that's out there and, and, and every denomination that's out there, that, 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 that is out there. But I can guarantee you this, not everybody in heaven is going to be a Baptist, and there are going to be a lot fewer Baptists up there than we imagine. It's just the way that it is. Uh, uh, we're not saved because we have Baptists on the, uh, that we go to a Baptist church. Uh, and and the, doesn't, just because somebody goes to a different church doesn't mean they're not saved. All depends, really, on their faith in Christ. So how we treat one another is important. Now, I do believe that doctrine separates. And that's okay. In fact, it's good. We're to be separate from the world. And as, 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 especially with different doctrines, we need to, be, we need to separate ourselves from others. But, but, but be careful of how we treat them. Be careful about how we talk down about them and and I'll be honest, the Baptists have been very bad about that over the years. Um, I don't know what here necessarily, uh, here necessarily uh, in, in the last 50 years, the church is 50 years old, but I know just in, in the Baptist denomination, they can get very judgmental over a lot of things. I've heard Baptists talk about other Baptist colleges that they don't disagree with. I've heard them separate over some of the craziest, stupidest things. You need to be very careful. We're to be united in Christ. And that unity glorifies God. He's not going to ask for our church affiliation when we get to heaven. We need to make sure that we are in love with Christ, in love serving one another. And 
working with, another, with one another. So we know that the word of God, the truth of God, abounds with glory. We know that, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that him working in us brings honor to him. Our faith glorifies God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. Look at verse, we'll start verse 13. We have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Am I in the right chapter? Yes. Yeah. Knowing that which he raised up, the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you for all things that are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For all things that are, are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. The thanksgiving, our thanksgiving, glorifies God. It, it, here the context is talking about being thankful for the grace of God. And as those that are, 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 are thanking God for the grace or giving thanks for, for the grace of God, that redounds or, or rebounds or builds up it, it, the, the, to the glory of God. Or to be grateful. I mean, could, how many of us can honestly say here today that we're grateful for what God has done for us? Hopefully everybody. I'm thankful for my salvation. I'm thankful for, for, for how he has worked in my life. I'm thankful for his grace. I'm thankful for his mercy. I'm thankful for second chances. I'm thankful for, for uh, my wife who got saved and how God worked in that situation. And I'm thankful for my, my children. I'm thankful that I didn't get the things that I wanted when I was a teenager. I'm, I'm thankful for a lot. right? We have much to be thankful for. I'm thankful for how he's not done with me, but he continues to work in my life. Those are, those are things that we can be thankful for. But as we're thankful, as we're, we're thanking God and rejoicing and praising God, that brings honor and glory to God. Too many times, you know what I see in Christians' face, faces? Instead of thanksgiving, instead of joy, <sighs> life's hard, you know. Got COVID again. This happened, that happened, car didn't start, all kinds of, we, we can come up with all kinds of different complaints. The truth is, life is hard, right? Uh, uh, half of us here in the last week have, have dealt with some kind of trial that uh, uh, life can be difficult. But in the midst of that trial, if we're thanking God for what he's done, that's not normal. It isn't. Because the world, you know what they like to do? Complain. Have you ever been on Facebook? Any kind of social media? All it is is people grumbling and complaining about everything. You can complain about your job. You can complain about your wife. You can complain about your husband. You can complain about your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your ex, your, 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 your soon-to-be ex, whatever. You can complain about uh, your car. You can complain about the, the, the government. You can complain about the people that are against the government. You can complain about everything and everybody. And that's what the world is all about. The problem is when you have Christians that do the same thing. Listen, uh, we, the, the Bible says it rains in the just and the unjust. If you're standing outside, standing next to a lost sinner, and it starts raining on you, guess what? Both of your heads are going to get wet. There's not going to be an angel standing next to you with an umbrella saying, I got you, George. That's not how it works. What you have is the Holy Spirit inside of you. Now, uh, I, I told this story a couple weeks ago about uh, taking, uh, taking uh, the kids for a walk, and we got stuck in the rain. And I want to tell you, when that, that rain started to fall, I was not happy. I do not like walking in the rain. Like, if, if, I have to, if I'm standing in my, in my house looking at my car and it's raining really hard, I will wait. There, there was, there was a, a, a couple weeks ago, I was at the gym, and, and my wife wanted me to come home, and the, the rain was pouring down. I mean like sheets. And I'm like, it's okay if I'm late. I'll just stand right here and stay dry. 
I hate it. So, so here we are, we're walking, and the rain starts to fall, and, and it's, it's hitting all of us, and, and in, inside, and going, I, I'm, the, I'm not really growling, but that's on the inside. I don't like it. The cold water hitting me sporadically wasn't, I just don't enjoy that. I, I don't like to play water games anymore. That was when I was a kid. The kids think it's hilarious. And they're, they're, Jimmy was having a great time. Uh, he loved the rain. And the, the, the more the rain came, the more... But there came to a point when I couldn't get any wetter. And finally, I started laughing. And my wife says, are you crazy? What's, what's wrong with you? The only worst thing could happen right now is lightning could strike and I could die. And hey, then I'm in heaven. So it was, hey, this, it's not that bad anymore. What happened? What changed? My perspective. The kids had a great, great time. Uh, I, I heard that was all Jimmy could talk about when he got home was the rainstorm that we got caught in. Do you like that, Jimmy? <laughs> no? He did not like it. I didn't like it at first either. But how we respond in our trials will either show the world that we're just like them or it'll glorify God. I think of, I think of Paul and Silas as they're in that jail after preaching the gospel. They've been beaten. They've been, uh, they've been uh, literally beaten. I don't mean just like roughed up a little bit. They were beaten. Uh, and they, were, they were put in, in shackles and they locked in. And listen, it wasn't like a jail today where you got TV and, and three square meals a day. It, it was a jail, uh, right? It was, uh, they, they, they weren't getting out of there and it wasn't going to be a pleasant time. But instead, the Bible says at midnight, they sang praises unto God. And then the earth shook and the doors popped open. What happened? They praised God. And it glorified him. Because everybody that was in that jail with them, they all heard it. Nobody escaped. And, and when, when the, the jailer was getting ready to kill himself, they said, hey, do thyself no harm. We're all still here. What was the first question out of his mouth? You crazy guys, what were you singing about in there? No. What must I do to be saved? What did that do? It brought glory to God. Maybe if, if Christians would start responding in the midst of their trials and their, their difficulties with praise and thanksgiving, uh, uh, it, we might see more people respond with, what do you have that I don't? It just might bring honor and glory to God. I believe, according to Scripture, it will. 2 Corinthians chapter 15. We're nearing the end. Second Corinthians, I said 15, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians chapter 12. I gave you the wrong chapter. It's verse 15. We're going to actually go back a little bit. It says, uh, we're going to look at verse 8. Uh, verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure, this is Paul speaking, uh, through the abundance of the revelation there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above, the measure, above measure. This is Paul talking about how he could have gloried in all of, of, of what he did, glorify in himself, but instead God gave him a, a, a thorn in the flesh to, to humble him. And he describes it as a messenger of Satan. Uh, a thorn in the flesh, so we're, nobody's 100% sure of what that could be, but though uh, many believe it's his eyesight because, well, he struggled with his eyesight, and he, that's mentioned in several of his letters. It, it was written by somebody else's hand because he couldn't see, or, or in some of the letters he wrote that he wrote it in his own hand to signify just how important it was to him uh, that was done. But So some think it was his eyesight. We don't know for sure what it was, but uh, let's continue reading verse, for verse 8. For this thing, this this thorn in the flesh, I besought the Lord thrice that he might, that it might depart from me. And he said, God's response unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Uh, what is, what is, uh, what is that saying? He's saying, he's saying, listen, there was this, this, this physical ailment that I had, and I've asked God to remove it from me. In fact, I asked him three times, and God's response was, my grace will be sufficient for you. He stopped asking. 
He says, Paul, I'm not going to take it from you, but I'm going to help you through it. So Paul's response to that was, most gladly will I glory in my infirmities that the power of God might rest upon me. He says, listen, uh, I'm struggling here. I, I, if it was his eyesight, if he was nearly blind, it, it was hard for him to see. That, that, that's a, he was a man who traveled. He was a man who wrote several, several letters. In fact, more than, uh, more than he, he studied the parchments. And he was in, in prison in, in Rome. He asked for those, those parchments to be sent to him. Why? So he could study it. He had trouble reading. This was a difficulty for him. He, and he said, Lord, please just take it away. God said, no, but I'll give you the grace that you need to go through it. And, and he understood that this was to humble him. But if it humbled Paul, it glorified God. Understand that that, that, that that weakness showed the strength and the power of God. Paul wasn't, <coughs> excuse me, Paul wasn't uh, a, 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 a powerful man to look upon. He spoke strong words, uh, but uh, the Bible says in, in Corinthians that he, was, uh, he came to him humbly and, and gently, and he wasn't considered a powerful preacher. He wasn't looked upon in that way, but God used him. See, in his weakness, God's power was shown. Our, our weaknesses, our infirmities, show the power of God. But we all have weaknesses. If I, if I start saying it, I want to start doing it, I stutter. I don't do it so much unless I'm, now I want to be careful. I don't stutter so much unless I am thinking about it, and then I, I can't stop. Hasn't happened a lot lately, praise the Lord. I know a pastor in Damascata, he stutters to beat the band. Brother, Brother Dave, some, some of you know him. Uh, love the man to death. Uh, it can be torture sometimes to try to listen to him. Uh, but God's using him. There are others. Uh, we had a man come to our church. He had polio. Uh, he'd spent the, uh, he was uh, the preacher from the Iron Lung, is how the, 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 the advertised. He spent years living in an Iron Lung. If you don't know what that is, it's a, it was a, a metal coffin like box like a hyperbaric chamber uh, that, uh, they, that would mechanically ventilate he spent years lying in that thing uh, he, he preached he stood with a cane he walked he struggled with his walk because he had polio there are others uh, who have other ailments and other weaknesses we all have weaknesses but instead of being angry about those weaknesses Instead of trying to, to, to get rid of those, the truth is we should learn to embrace those things. Not that we... Not that we want to elevate that, but we understand that God uses broken things and broken people. Sometimes the weaknesses or those infirmities are physical. Right? Some people have physical infirmities. You can glorify God in that. Now, that doesn't mean we should, listen, I had diabetes. I, that doesn't mean I live in my diabetes and, glory to God, I'm going to eat some more cake. That's not what I'm talking about. God's given me a body, I'm to take care of it to the best of my ability, that I might glorify him with it. But let's say that instead of diabetes, God gave me something that I couldn't fix. Cancer. I can glorify God in that. God gave, if God gave us any of those things. Now, it's easy to say. Let me, let me put this out there. It is easy to say that we should glory God, glorify God in these things. It's a whole lot different living it. But just like Paul, God will give us the grace that we need to do that. So as Paul said, we glorify God by glorying in our infirmities. Why? Because we are showing and revealing the power of God. Look at uh, Johnny, Johnny Erickson Tata, uh, the, the woman, uh, the t a teenager, paralyzed from the neck down from a diving accident. And, and God has used her in, to touch millions of lives over the years in, in teaching Christ, in, in uh, sharing her testimony, the books that she has written. She can paint better than I can with her teeth, and I can't 
God has used her. She embraced the weakness God brought into her life. Our, inform, our infirmities glorify God. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Starting in verse 9, in this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Our lives are to be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Well, what are the fruits of righteousness? I believe we could call them the fruit of the Spirit. I believe we could also say that fruit of righteousness is also the characteristics of Jesus Christ. Love, joy, peace, unsuffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those fruits of righteousness, the way we're filled with those fruits of righteousness is by being filled and yielded unto the Holy Spirit of God. Now, as, as, as saved individuals, the Bible tells us that we have the Holy Spirit. You and I have the Holy Spirit that dwells within us and it seals us until the day of redemption. What a day that will be when we get to heaven. Uh, but, and we're sealed until then. But that Spirit is doing a work in us now while we're here on this earth. He's to fill us. He fills us. We're to be filled. Yielded unto him. And as we're yielded unto him, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting that what's in us comes out. There is a bottle of H2O. Water. It's not coffee. It's not tea. I wish it was coffee. It is not. Uh, uh, I could wish there was a lot of things, but it's water. What water is good for you? If I were to knock this down with the cap off, what comes out? Water. Not coffee, not tea, not soda, or not diet soda, no, nothing but plain old pure water. Why is that? Because that's what's inside. What happens... What happens when you get bumped? What do I mean? Something happens in your life. Somebody happens in your life. Uh, somebody cuts you off in the drive-thru. Uh, somebody cuts in front of you in the line. Uh, the, person's, uh, the, the person in line is taking too much time. Uh, uh, it can be any number of things. Your, your, your spouse says something. Uh, uh, your kids do something. Uh, something happens. You get bumped. What comes out? Whatever comes out is what's inside of us. See, if, if there wasn't water in this, if there was soda in there, soda would come out. If there was tea, tea would come out. Coffee, coffee would come out. There's the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us, but are we filled with the Holy Spirit and yielded to the Holy Spirit? Because if we are, when we get bumped, do you know what will come out of us? Love, joy, peace, long suffering. See where I'm going with this? Those are the things that glorify God. Those attributes of Christ, those fruits of the Spirit, they glorify God. The question is, what comes out of us? Does it glorify God? Is it the fruit of the Spirit? Listen, I, none of us are, are perfect. Believe me, I, 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 I understand this from personal, from personal me, myself, right? When somebody cuts me off, somebody does something, naturally I want to respond. My wife many times like, why are you honking the horn at them? Because I have to. I don't have to. I choose to. I'm just letting them know that I'm here and I'm mad. <laughs> that's, that's my natural state. Your natural state isn't any better, by the way. 
And it may not be you got cut off and you blew your horn. It could be somebody did something and you lost your temper. It could be a snide remark or gossip or some other thing that happened in your life. See, we all have our own weaknesses. And it's easier for us to look at somebody else at their weakness and say, they really need to fix that. Brother George and his temper, every time he comes in here, he's yelling at me. I'm kidding. He doesn't yell at me. He's never yelled at me. Please don't start. <laughs> we all have our weaknesses, and Satan knows what those weaknesses are, and he knows how to push your buttons. He has been doing this for thousands of years. He, he, he has been studying you. He knows what you struggle with. He knows where you're weak. And listen, he knows when you're not on guard. And he knows when you're not filled with the Spirit. Because if you're filled with the Spirit, the Bible says that you will walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But when you're filled with the flesh, when you're filled with that natural response, you'll get angry. You'll gossip. You'll, you'll yell. You'll do those things in the natural person does. But that's not who we are anymore. And remember, whatsoever we do, we're to do for the glory of God. So our faith glorifies God. The way the word of God works in us, that glorifies God. Our, our trials, they glorify God as long as we respond in the, in the correct way. The fruit of righteousness in our life, that glorifies God. Everything that we do is to be done for the glory of God. That also means that the things, even the things that we, the good things that we do, we're to do them to the best of our ability. The very best. If you're going to be a soul winner, be the best soul winner you can be. Be on fire. Be in the word. Be prepared. Be prayed up. Go out and be that soul winner. I mean, come on. If you, had an, if you had a business and you had an employee and you had two employees, and one guy just came in and clocked in and did the bare minimum of what he had to do. I've seen those employees. I've been those, that employee a, a, a time or two uh, in, my, in my life, right? Uh, you see, listen, they never get ahead. I, uh, when I was a paramedic at, at, at the, the private ambulance service over here, there was a young man who, who wanted a, a promotion, and he went in, and he, he, he went in for the promotion, and they, the, the HR manager told him there was no way that she would ever give him a promotion. He says, he says, listen, I'm no worse than anybody else. That's your problem. You don't stand out. He came, he came, I was his FTO, his field training officer. He came to me because I don't understand. What do I got to do? I said, more than everybody else. Be the guy that stands out. Don't be late. Don't be just on time. Come early. Come early and make sure your truck is ready to go and you're all prepared and study. study and be, don't just come in and do your job, but come in and be prepared. And, do, and for, for the first time, the first millennial I ever saw do it, he listened to me. Now, that wasn't the first person that ever listened to me, but he took that advice. And you know what he did? He started showing up early. He started uh, making sure the truck was not just clean, everything was exactly the way it was supposed to be, and better than that. He would, he would work with the paramedics and find out what, how they wanted things, and, and, and then he would make sure it was like that in, in, in their truck. Man, he was doing great. He started going to every, every training he could get, started reading and studying, and pretty soon he was in medical school, and he became a paramedic, and guess what? He's now a field training officer over at that place. In fact, I believe he works in education as well. He got, a, he got that promotion plus a promotion. What happened? He became the guy that they wanted to be there. He gave it his all. He didn't come in and be lazy. There are a lot of Christians that are lazy Christians. They read the Bible because, well, they know they're supposed to. They, they go to church, and they do the bare minimum of what we can do to get away with. Listen, it says, whatsoever we do to all to the glory of God. And I understand that we're all in different areas of our spiritual maturity and Christian growth. I understand that. Grow as fast as you can. Let the word of God work in you. Do you glorify God in everything that you do? Which means we need to stop and take a look at everything that we do. Is there anything in my life that I'm doing that does not glorify God? 
Sometimes it's a hard question to ask ourselves. Is, is, is my attitude when I go to church, does that glorify God? And my service, does that glorify God? The, the way that I work in my job, does that glorify God? The way that I treat my family, does that glorify God? The things that I watch, does that glorify God? The stuff that I listen to, does that glorify God? The news that I watch, does that glorify God? The conversations I get myself into, does that glorify God? The, the choices that I make for my life, does that glorify God? Because everything that we are, everything that we do is to glorify God. Whatsoever ye do. Do it all to the glory of God. Does our life, does your life glorify God? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for how you work in us. Lord, and I know we're not perfect, and we'll never be perfect until we get to heaven. But God, I pray that you would continue to work in us and make us to be more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you put a fire in us, a desire to, to, to be more like you, to serve you better. Uh, to, to, to bring honor and glory to your name. Help us to examine our hearts and our lives and, and our choices, Lord, that, uh, that we might uh, make sure that our lives glorify you, Father. We thank you so much for loving us. We thank you so much for your word that works in us. We thank you so much for your spirit uh, that, that, that fills us. And God, I pray that you'd help us to be filled with your spirit. Help us to live our lives for you. Lord, we love you. And thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.